I was raised in the 80s Bricks in the place these days were a madness Nights were just crazy Looking back grateful for the man that it made me All about the future but I reminisce daily Yes, this is Junior. <laughs> He's big and fat and shaved. I don't know if you can see. I, I give him a shave. He's a long hair, but uh, yeah. <laughs> he looks very pleased to be with us. <laughs> oh, he, 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 look at my kitties. You can do anything to them. They, they love attention and you can, you, you, know, you can do anything. He's a talker. He sounds annoyed, but he's just a talker. Oh, he's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. I may have I always to let trust him an animal second. lover. That's it. Always trust an animal lover. Um, guys, I'll kick off by, and I kind of briefly told Kurt this in the beginning. Since starting Joe, I've noticed a theme. And I knew this when I was an actor as well, fellow actors. And I have a theory, you know, a lot of people might not agree, but I think that the nature of the job, the type of people that are attracted to this type of work, we put ourselves on the line. Our egos, our spirits, we're literally laying everything bare, you know, if we're doing it right. And that has a price. And the price comes in the form of reviews and what do we think of ourselves and what do other people think of us. And we all have our own kind of demons or you know as you say and you have to act you have to do as they say razzle dazzle them in this business and Kurt more than anyone I know resoundingly just gets along with everyone and the more I got to know Kurt and you hear more about his background I think it's because of the way Kurt was raised I do think that Kurt was raised with a very strong sense of self so that there was always that to fall back on, regardless of, I, I know a lot of us are kind of feel like we're blowing in the wind all the time. One day we're amazing. The next day we're the worst narrators on the face of the earth and we're absolute rubbish. And, and I think it's just something that happens. But I also think that we've got Kurt here and we're actors. So we might not get the stable upbringing, childhood, inner core of self-confidence, right? Having had to be born with that, but we can fake it and try to like get a little bit of Kurt's mindset and his charm. And I think a lot of it is inner self-confidence and also genuinely liking people because he's, because hearing Kurt and I want to hear some of the stories about you networking the first time at APAC and and I also want to hear about the whole circus thing and didn't you like break your back drinking fire or something <laughs> Bro broke my neck doing um uh acrobatics yes how did you get into acting Kurt and how and was it hard in the beginning or were you always just kind of confident in the beginning um well, I got into acting in the fifth grade. Um, I mean, I think even before that, I was always sort of a performer. And I think part of that comes from my father, which is really interesting because my father is a very, me and my sister used to call him like the robot. He's a very sort of uh, logical person. He, he's sort of unemotional, like he doesn't outwardly express a lot. But he was a, a musician and a singer as well. Uh, he, he was a businessman, but he also, he sang barbershop um, when I was really little and was a, an amazing singer and, and could woodshed any part, which means you just get together with four guys and pick a part and you just sing. Uh, he could do that. He played a little guitar. He taught me how to play piano. He played clarinet. So he had this artistic side that was very different from who he sort of seemed like. And um, so I think that's sort of how I learned about performing. And I was always just very outgoing. And then um, in the fifth grade, uh, the town I lived in outside Chicago had a children's theater. And uh, I think my parents may have, I don't remember fifth grade, but I mean, I remember all of this distinctly. I just don't remember specifically why I auditioned, but I auditioned for one of the shows. It was Cinderella and I got into the chorus 
And <laughs> it's funny because I don't particular, I don't act because of what I, um, for, well, I mean, of course I act for the audience because to me, without an audience, there is no performance. Um, I very much believe the audience is a, an integral part of that. If you're just doing it for yourself, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but opening night, I mean, I will never forget this. Opening night, curtain call. Came out for curtain call and with the audience applauding and, and that was it. I knew immediately. I went, this is what I want to do. And that was it. I was done the rest of my life. The, I have never stopped. Uh, it's, I just knew. I knew in that moment that I needed to be a performer and uh, I always have. Um, I from that moment on, I was always performing. Um, audiobooks have certainly changed that uh, as far as performing for a live audience. Um, I was almost always in a play uh, up until uh, just a couple of years ago when I moved from LA to Atlanta. Um, I have done some theater here as well, but uh, before I left is when I started audio audiobooks and it sort of started sating that need to perform because uh, I get to do it whenever I want here all on my own. But uh, yeah, that that's how I became an actor and I've done it ever since, you know, I just, I, that's what I studied in college as well. And um, among lots of other things I've done, you know, I was a professional juggler and uh, I've, played a lot of sports and all sorts of other stuff, but acting is the one thing that has been consistent throughout acting and music, but uh, uh, yeah, specifically acting. Now I have a question. I don't understand what it means though. James says R and H. I don't know what that is. What is that? Rogers and Hammerstein. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no. Oh, you know, I have no idea, James, what version it was. I think it was oh. a specifically children's theater version. Yeah. So I don't yeah, think I've the ever, famous musical. I, 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 yeah, I fell in love with, um, oh, who was it that played Cinderella? I can't remember. It was on TV back in the 60s. I'm dating myself. Uh, but yeah, it was a Rodgers and Hammerstein version, the musical version. Cinderella, I don't think I've ever Cinderella, done any Rodgers and Hammerstein yeah. In all my years, I don't think I've ever done any Rodgers and Hammerstein. That's a bucket list thing. I don't, I don't think. <laughs> I've done about half of them. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. bet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I hadn't even thought about Rodgers and right. Hammerstein. Hold on. I'm gonna years. let him, I'm gonna let the kitty out. He's okay. Yelling at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, okay. So. All right. So Circus Tales, yes, please. That, I was going to go there next. So how did you end up breathing fire and breaking your neck? Um, that <laughs> all came from, well, a couple of things. My father taught me to juggle. He happened to know how to juggle three balls. So he taught me how to juggle when I was little. Um, so I always knew how to juggle three balls. And then in high school, I was on the gymnastics team and randomly, a couple other guys knew how to juggle, and three of us in particular, um, just we started practicing after gymnastics practice and before play rehearsal, and um, me and one of the other guys, if you ever want to look him up, his name is Mark the Knife Fay. F-A-J-E, <laughs> and he, this is still what he does. He is still a variety performer. He's known as the world's most dangerous comic. You may have seen him on David Letterman or other, uh, he was on um, America's Got Talent. Um, me and him sort of really just decided to do that. And we would, we would practice eight hours a day. And um, the year after we started juggling, I... I won the junior national juggling competition. He came in third. Um, we performed at Renaissance fairs and theme parks and parties. And I, it, I don't know. We just sort of fell into the variety world. And uh, how old were, how old were you at this time? Eat fire. And that was when I was, I think I started at, 
I know 16, 15, 16. Because my birthday's in the summer. So, um, yeah, 15 to 16. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun. So, I haven't done much of it in a long time. But uh, So how did you break yeah. your neck? Is it too painful to think about? Ah, oh, no. Uh, I was 16. It was, I think, in the... Right, it was in the summer between my ju sophomore and junior year, and I was a, so I was a gymnast, and I was I was pretty good, and I was already on the varsity team. And I've been training all that summer as well as doing all the circus stuff with my partner, and we were working at the we were working at Six Flags and the Renaissance Fair, and and um, and. Uh, he, we were a part of the, in, I lived in Illinois outside of Chicago and in uh, Wisconsin was this uh, Windy City Circuit. It's funny because it was based in, oh no, it was based in Illinois, Antioch, no, Northern Illinois, um, called the Windy City Circus. And it was a youth volunteer circus. And my other two friends had been doing it. They were both gymnasts and jugglers too. And I went up and visited one night before they came down to um to chicago to do a show and i wasn't actually a part of it at the time but throughout the the two days that we did that and then traveling down to do the show they convinced the circus manager to let me perform with them and he didn't have any waivers so he wasn't going to but they convinced him to let me do the show we get to chicago we're on navy pier we're doing shows and it happened to be the the show my parents came to watch which is part of why this happened oh, i was wow. showing off for my parents there was a there was a part of a part of the routine where we uh, there was a mini trampoline and someone would do a front flip off the mini trampoline and then get on their hands and knees someone would do a front flip of, off of them and then get next to the person on their hands and knees and so you'd build up people and people would jump far, do flips farther over more people Normally I did two or three people. This time I decided to do 10 and uh, I made it. I landed on my feet, but I was just going too fast into the front roll and landed on the top of my head and dislocated and fractured my neck. Oh my God. In the middle of a performance with my parents watching. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was very, very lucky, very lucky. I also happened to be about 10 minutes away from the best spinal unit in the country at the time. Um, Chicago Memorial. Um, a lot of weird stuff about it. That that year in my health class, I had done an extra credit report on an article I read in a health magazine about a doctor who invented a new um, spinal fusion surgery, who ended up being my surgeon. Uh, so I was very lucky being close to that hospital, as well as I got literally the guy who invented the surgery did my surgery. So. I don't know if you can see, but I have a zipper. I have a scar there. Oh my God. So did so you have problems I have a piece with of, it? You have problems eventually, with it. So eventually, they, they told me then at 16 that I would eventually get um, arthritis. And at 16, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right, sure, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and you too, James, you got arthritis in your neck? Aha. Uh -huh. So... I was fine. I mean, again, I had an amazing surgeon. I've never had any issues. I went immediately back to doing gymnastics and snowboarding and all sorts of, I'm a bit of a daredevil. Um, my parents just love that. Um, so you didn't learn your but, lesson uh, about that after breaking your neck? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, again, it's like lightning striking. Like, hey, am I going to break my neck twice? <laughs> Probably not. Um, so, but about three or four years ago, um, I all of a sudden started having problems with my neck. It was very strange. Um, I've always, because of that, I've always hated like when people crack their necks, I, I, I freak out. It freaks me out. And uh, so I don't crack my neck. I've never, and all of a sudden, every time I turned my head, I would hear my neck cracking. And then it would like 
kind of, well, I don't know whether it was the tension of hearing it cracking and feeling this weird thing that also caused me a lot of tension. And I just started getting a lot of pain and tension and like my neck would lock. If I'd look down, it would like lock up and I would have to like sort of pop it back out. And uh, I went and, you know, had an MRI and stuff. And they said, yes, you know, you have the early stages of, of um, uh, arthritis and all that stuff. And you and do know your audience here. Just, you do know that we're sitting here going, because we all stand in that booth all day. We're sitting here imagining that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lately, I, I had had some issues lately, actually, but I don't, it wasn't really my neck. It was kind of both my neck and my shoulders, and it was bad sitting in the booth, but it's gone away. But yeah, about six months into that whole crazy weird neck thing, it just vanished, and it hasn't come back. So oh, really? I, I don't, and I'm a lazy ass mofo, and I did not do the kind of physical therapy I should have, so... I don't know why, and I'm sure it's going to come back to bite me at some point, and I really should do some things to not <laughs> make that happen again, but it's okay now in general, so, but, Were you, you know, going through stress it, when I do it, have arthritis, it and it's degenerating. But were you going through stress when it y came up? Y y yeah, I mean, there was stress as well as some good stuff. I, yeah, there was, there was definitely stuff going on. Um, because the, there's that, a book could called be The Great Pain Deception, sure. Kurt, that says that your body will, if it foresees danger, it oh, will yeah. create pain to s protect you. Absolutely, hundred percent. I've I've had hives, and I know that it was purely stress, yeah. like no other reason. And uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So, stress will cause lots of physical ailments. So you navigate the minefield of the narrators, the networking. I loved your stories about APAC. I mean, some of your stories weren't even what you did, but what a friend of yours did. And but but the common element is that these people are your friends, and and the publishers are your friends, and you genuinely enjoy. But how do you? How do you never even have any thoughts about, oh my God, do I look like a twat? Have I said the wrong thing? Do you just, doesn't enter your mind? Well, I, I don't have the, I don't have that like, oh, I look like an idiot kind of a thing because I think part of it, the, the performing, my whole life in performance has been about looking like an idiot. Like that's <laughs> what I do. Uh, you know, the farther I can take it, the further I can commit to looking like an idiot, the, the better. Like, it, it, yeah, James gets it. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've never really worried about how I look or how I come off. And I think a lot of that, like you said, comes from my upbringing. I had really, I have great parents. They were very supportive. Um, they weren't doting, but they didn't put me down. You know, they, they didn't tell me I couldn't do things. So I never had a sense of like, oh, I, I shouldn't or can't try something. And, um, and, and my mother in particular was very much into sort of um, mind work and self-hypnosis and things like that and training your brain and, and programming that stuff, you know, so that you, you, you know, getting rid of the negative programming. So that I was very mother. effective. She's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and I was very lucky to, to have that. Um, so I didn't, and I believe me, I'm very close with people who did not have that and had parents who put them down and told them they weren't good and things like that. And it's, it, you know, it affects them to this day in their forties and fifties. And it's those stories that we're told that we keep telling ourselves that other people told us that can really negatively affect us. And, uh, and that's something I've continued continued throughout my life is studying that kind of stuff um um I've done, I've done all sorts of my my sister was a buddhist for a while so i did that she also did uh the forum if anybody knew the forum which uh, i so i took that and it's a bit of a cultish thing too but then there's some there's good stuff it came out of um esp um and um 
uh, I don't know if anybody's watching The Vow right now. Anybody, mm-hmm. anybody watching The Vow on HBO? Is it a reality uh, show? It, it's a documentary about another group that is like that, that is, ends up being a cult and it's their people are indicted and stuff. But the basis of it is some good things that are about deprogramming yourself and and so much of it is about, uh, you know, like I said, the stories we tell ourselves. And uh, so luckily I learned not to tell myself those negative stories. And if I did to sort of shift that, um, oh, where was I going? Where, where did we start um, on this? I, I had a point I was going to uh, 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 Oh my God, I was so interested in, what, in your story. I forgot where, what even brought it up. I already have my oh, next gosh. question. Oh, uh, not, not have, I did, right, I didn't have the embarrassment thing, like worrying about how I come off yeah, or how I look. You never had those feelings. Um, not really. Um, luckily, the feelings that I do have, though, and it's a major reason why I have not been as successful in the on-camera industry is, and it's that networking thing. And, um, you know, in my life and, especially 30 years in Los Angeles and in the entertainment industry, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people. I've met a lot of celebrities and directors and producers and all these people. And, and I realized like I could make a, a famous actor and be fine. I can talk to a famous actor, I think, because like I relate to them. We do the same thing. But when it came to anybody that could hire me, casting directors, directors, producers, that's where I would get clamped up. I, I had that and, you know, the, this still hasn't gone away. Um, that whole thing, it's like, oh, they can hire me. They're, impo- they're more important than me. You know, they, they hold yeah. something that I need. And that's when I would get nervous and not be myself. You know, I feel like I need to either not bother them. That's a big part of it for me is like, oh, I I don't want to be a bother. You know, my sister is in the industry long before me even um, on the production side. And she introduced me to major casting directors and directors and stuff. And I'd meet them. And that's great. When I meet them in a social environment, especially if it was like at a rap party or something like that's great, especially if I don't know who they are at first, that's even better. So that's another trick I try to use sometimes if I'm meeting somebody that I think is important, I'll pretend like I have no idea who they are. They're just another person because that is the reality. They are just another person and they want to be liked just as much as you do. You know, that's, that's really the thing that you have to always remind yourself of is we all have the same kinds of insecurities and like want to be liked. doesn't matter who you are. In fact, Look at our president. Sorry, now I don't want to get political, but look at our president. He acts like he's all that. And we know it's because he's the most insecure person in the world. So a lot of times people who are a lot of bluster, it's because they're terribly insecure. So you can recognize that, you know, and, and we all have that. So, you know, meeting those people that can offer you jobs can be intimidating and a little nerve wracking because you want to be you know, your best and you want to be interesting and clever. And, you know, when you're trying, that's just never, it doesn't usually work out that well. And it sets us up for it, Um, huh? Because we're told we have to do certain things and you have to act a certain way and certain publishers want you to send this to them and only this, and they don't want to be bothered with this. Avon said, this is what, whereas it could be, this is what I can offer you, which is a good point because you're offering them a service it's like the old sales thing how can i be of benefit but it's so hard to remember when it is you want the job and that's the same thing in in the in the on-camera world it's the exact same thing with casting directors every single one of them tells you they they want you to be great they are not looking to critique you they are not looking for you to be bad and pick you apart um they hope you're the greatest thing ever and that they discover you. So that's sort of what you really just need to go into any of those situations. Remembering is, is they need you. They need you. They have no job without you. 
<laughs> a casting director is nothing without the actor. They literally so, have well, no job without talented people to bring to the people they work for. They're trying to impress someone else too. So, you know, just remembering that, that you have something to offer them. You are providing something that they need. Um, but even more than that, and what I've found and why the audiobook world to me in general, I, I just, I have an easier time with it. I'm not sure exactly why, except I think one of the reasons is, is because it is such its own little world and there isn't really fame except within it that there's, um, there's less of that stress. There's less of that like, um, oh, this is someone huge. It's like, oh, yes. this is a person that, oh, I know who they are. And, oh, I know a bunch of people that already know them too. That's the opposite and with I've me. I've heard their name. And That's the really? opposite. That's the exact opposite with me. I had no problem acting, none. Because I, did, I barely recognized anyone anyway, and I couldn't care less who they were. So I had like no fear of people that were supposedly really high up. I didn't even really remember who they were supposed to be. So I was fine. But the audiobook industry... It is a close-knit community, and it's like being in high school. It's like you got to be part of the in-group. I mean, I love the in-group. Don't get me wrong. I love every single one of the narrators, but it does feel sometimes like everyone's friends. Like, And that I find harder. I find it much easier going out business-wise and saying, I got the stuff. Here I am. Here are my credentials. Yeah, pretty big high school, but that's what it feels like. It feels like a really big high school. And I did great in the high school because I was out in the parking lot with the weirdo guys that were smoking something. I wasn't like being a cheerleader. <laughs> and I, I guess maybe that's a part of it too with my upbringing. Part of that, like for me in high school, you know, it could have gone very badly for me throughout school for many reasons. Um, I was a th musical theater guy and in choir <laughs> and... I also looked like a girl, so I was mistaken for a girl a lot. Um, I've been mistaken, not, there's no problem with this, but I was mistaken for gay my whole life, still am, which could be a problem, especially, you know, in the, 80, in the 80s. But instead of that being an issue for me, I just made friends with everybody. I had friends in every group. You know, I, I had friends who were burnouts and jocks and the nerds and the theater geeks and all that because I didn't care. I didn't identify as only one thing. And like you said, I like people. I always have. I just, I like yeah. people. I think pe people are fun and fascinating. Even assholes are interesting. Like there's something interesting about everybody so i like to get to know people and um and so that's what i did and if people came at me whatever like you know and i that, that's something else about all this is again coming back to this idea of the stories we tell <clears throat> um who is it uh i was just watching oh i don't know if any of you ever uh, know who um darren brown is he's a british a uh, mentalist and magician. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you yep. don't know him, Darren Brown. Oh yeah, you're you're in England. He, he you probably know yep. more of him than most people. He's amazing. He's phenomenal. He's also an avowed atheist and a Stoic and uh, speaks at Stoic conventions and stuff. But he's kind of a philosopher. I'm actually listening to his audiobook right now, uh, Happy, which is fantastic. And um, he talks a lot about this stuff and. Um, Oh God! What is the name? I feel like I have a, um, Epictetus. Ep Epictetus, Epi a Roman Epi philosopher. Epi Epictetus. 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 Um, oh, Epictetus. I actually think it is. I think you're right. Um, <laughs> Epictetus. There. Yeah. But he talked about Epictetus. you know, there are things you're in control of and things you're not in control of, and this has been something I've, you know looked at a lot throughout my life and so many people worry so much and put so much energy into the things they have no control over and it just creates so much stress that is absolutely unnecessary 
And if you literally just separated those things, and, and there are only two things that we are in control of. We are in control of our thoughts and our actions. That is it. And, and everything else, especially when it has to do with someone else, we, we all, and it all, again, comes back to these stories that we tell. We all have these, we tell so many stories about what other people are thinking. And in particular, what they are thinking about us. We have no way of knowing. There is absolutely, and literally, even if you ask them flat out, you may not get the real answer. So you just, you have to stop worrying about those things. If you just go, all right, here's what I'm in control of. All this other stuff that I'm not in control of, that's just fine. It's fine. It is what it is. You will relieve yourself of so much stress. And when it comes to like networking, a lot of that is you're so worried about what they're going to think of you. You have no control over that. It does not matter. All you can do is be who you are. And, and even then, a lot of times the things we think are wrong with us are the things that make us interesting to other people and are memorable about us and <clears throat> are the things that are going to stand out, uh, not the thing, oh, God, I said the wrong thing. It's like, oh, they may have thought that was funny or... More likely, they didn't notice at all. They have no clue. They're not thinking about they're it at all. And they're themselves. probably not thinking about you at all. <laughs> so, um, and do you we know spend what? so Kurt, much time thinking people are, you know, conspiring against us or thinking like thinking about this us. and that about us when they're not thinking about us at all. They're wrapped up in their own stuff. So, do you know what? Do you know you what? Know, I learned with the quarantine, it's a it. shock. Sorry, I'm cutting you off. I think we've got a buffer and I'm like talking over you as we talk. But with no, the no, quarantine, I learned that lesson when I realized that the entire, that people are actually, not only are they not thinking about me, they're not even living in the same world as me. We all see things so differently. Oh, yeah. And like, I couldn't believe people were complaining about not going to job. I assumed that everyone that went out to those horrible jobs hated every minute of it. I felt really sorry for them. It turns out some of them wanted to go and like are dying to get back and like like to leave the house and like commute and stand with a bunch of strangers and talk sure. about Well, one, some people love that. Some people also may think they like that because we're also married to um, routine. Uh, routine gives us comfort. And uh, again, relating it to networking, pushing out of your comfort zone. I mean, that's something that just as an actor, I have always strived for. I like to, I love to take on parts that I don't think I can do. And now it's like with books, if there's something like, oh, that's tough, give it to me. Like, I want to prove to myself that I can do that. And it's not prove it to other people. It's I want to, I want to take that challenge on for myself. And, but I think a lot of people with, uh, get so comfortable in their, in their general daily routine that they, they think they want to do those things, but they may not. Um, a lot of people also, um, especially in America, I don't know about England, maybe a similar mindset. I don't know, but Europeans are very different. We're so married to what we do as who we are, um, that it's very difficult. I, I know a lot of actors right now, this is a big thing because of the pandemic, like acting has shut down. I mean, it's coming back now. I know a lot of people who are working again, but theater in particular, live performance is really, you know, kind of dead right now. And I am absolutely guilty of this too, because my life has been defined by being an actor. You know, I need to be on stage. And so many performers, you know, we're defined by what job we're doing doing now and in audiobooks it's, it's like what, what book are you doing you know and if you don't have a book and this relates actually back to uh my apac uh thing I'll, I'll i'll get to um you know if you're not acting like who are you who am i if i'm not performing yep. and are i think a lot a of people have that in all, all different careers our career is who we are which is not true yeah. um and i'm I'm hoping the pandemic helps more people connect with who they actually are and what they actually really want just as human beings, as opposed to what we do. Um, 
Luckily, the arts, I think, are a little different than a lot of things. I mean, granted, some people love doing finances, you know, <laughs> and, and being a plumber or whatever it is. Um, you know, I, f- I find the arts to be very fulfilling. Uh, you know, it, it, it fills my soul as well. So I think that also makes it a little harder sometimes for artists when we're not creating art is because it is such a fulfilling thing that if we're not doing it, we, it's, it, it, we feel a little bit lost. Um, yeah, like the days off. But it, you know how everyone kept saying, take days off. I tried one. I didn't like it. It was horrible. <laughs> it's, when your identity's wrapped up in it, that's who you are. And it makes James has a question, had a question a long time ago, and I don't want to lose track of it. Um, what advice do you have for somebody about follow up? Where they're good at reaching out once, oh. but they're not good at follow up. What do you think that stems from? Whew. I tell you, okay, well, that's another issue. Uh, like I said, with the, like my sister introducing me to big casting directors and producers and stuff, uh, that was the end of that story that I didn't tell was she introduced me to people that could have made my career had I followed up. And my sister, who is phenomenal with follow-up, she literally stays in touch with everyone she has ever met. Every business contact as well as she's a location manager. So she deals with, you know, people who own houses and buildings and whatever. And she ends up being friends with those people. Like we had, we had Thanksgiving dinner at the American Beauty House because she found that house and then she became friends with the family. And then the next thing you know, we're having Thanksgiving there. And that's why she's incredibly successful at what she does. <laughs> I, I would never follow up. And I'd be terrified because I'm like, they don't want to hear from me. Like, who am I? Like, and my sister would tell me every time she says, that's the business. They expect it. This is, this is how it works. They don't, you know, they know this is how it works. And uh, so just say hi, (laughs) like literally just say hello. Like just wanted to say hello. Any little thing like that, just to keep top of mind kind of a thing, as well as in an industry where that is how it works. And that relates very much to the audiobook world and APAC in particular, as you'll hear from a lot of people, is the publishers go to APAC knowing that we are there to meet them. So there's no reason to be afraid of it. There's no reason to be afraid of introducing yourself to a publisher at APAC because that's why we're there. They know that. They know it. That's, that's why we're there. So just APAC in general is a perfect, a perfect place for that. Other arenas, I don't know, you know, but where do we meet people in, in the audiobook world is in audiobook situations. So we kind of all get it. And I think all the publishers do they all they all know we all want to work for them like it's not a, which is also why you don't have to talk about that you don't actually ever have to talk about you don't have to say i'd love to be a part of your roster they know that of course you do <laughs> why why wouldn't you um what's more interesting and this is the thing i keep hearing over and over now from every publisher they don't care about necessarily your work i mean yes i mean no they care if you're good of course they 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 want to know if you're good at what you do but i'm just going to assume we're all good at what we do you should too just know you're good keep working at it obviously we all need to keep training and working and growing um but assume you're good assume they know you're good so what else who you are they want to know who you are i mean that really seems to be the main thing is they want your actual personality and it's the same in the on-camera world and you hear it over and over and over is they want to know you they want to know who you are they want to know you know <clears throat> what your interests are uh the the regular the, the the non-audiobook shit you do and you know about because it will inform what they can cast you for um that said Getting to that, I think, is the tricky part. You don't want to just talk about you. That's like number one no-no in 
in face-to-face -face networking, um, you want to you want to know about them. It's much you can get a lot more out of it if you uh, talk to them about them, um, know something about them. <clears throat> that was uh, so that was part of the the uh, my uh, situation at APAC. I've only been to one APAC, and um, should I tell the whole story, yes, Daniela? I want to hear so the I, APAC story. And then before we, the end of the call, don't forget to tell you, tell me the thing you said about imposter syndrome and why you don't necessarily like the term. Uh, okay, so we definitely we have to cover those two things. And just real quick before I, I hear the story. I learned a little more about that too. Just real quick, I want to say, a peep, um, Tim had a good point. He said, people want to work with friends and they do, which is... I get what oh, I'm yeah. hearing from Kurt. And then James says, but enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Vintage James. Hey, exactly. <laughs> okay. And James knows story. all of this. James has been, James has been in this uh, entertainment world his whole life too. So he knows <laughs> how, the, how all this stuff works. And uh, I don't know if he feels the same way as me, but I I find the audiobook world to be a lot friendlier. I mean, the theater world is very friendly, but it's a yeah. it's a little more competitive uh, between people uh, than I find the audiobook world to be. Um, I just find th this industry is so. I mean, the fact that I've gotten other people work. And who am I? I and mean, I've gotten people working. People have gotten me, you know, other narrators. It's such a, a, a community of, uh, and, and that is true. That's part of it. It's like, hey, if you have friends in this industry, which we, we make friends, we're here, we all are. Like this, this community is made up of people who are interested in a very specific thing. So it's really easy to connect. Um, Oh yeah, getting other people. I see. Even said that it is. It's it's just the best. It's the best thing. And I really do believe helping others. And again, I found this so much in the voiceover world in general. Is you get a lot back. You get a lot back from helping others, especially like if you send someone who's great to a publisher, that publisher is going to remember you for help. Again, you helped them discover someone like. That's being an asset and being an asset can only help you. Even if it's not you getting that work, it's going to help you in the long run, probably get work. And you become better. They'll remember you for that. You become better. You become stronger yeah. and better at your job the more you help other people. You literally uh, become happier. I want to hear about APAC. <laughs> I agree. So, well, just my general APAC story was, was interesting because again, like, I don't like Ne well, I don't like schmoozing. I have never liked schmoozing. I love people and I love parties <laughs> and I am usually the last person to leave a party. Um, I love all that, but networking, you know, like going with a specific, you know, like I'm going to go meet people to try and get work from them kind of a thing. I've never liked that. It's never been my thing, but social events are great. And APAC is a big social event. It's really what it is. We're all these people stuck in our boxes and you know, like we all want to just go have a good time with each other, which is great. And also because of the world it is, people want to help each other. And there's, you probably know 20 people now that have relationships with publishers that would, <clears throat> excuse me, that would introduce you. So going into APAC was, was really interesting because I'd been doing really, I'd been working really consistently up until right before APAC. And all of a sudden I had no work booked and I was having that whole, that whole feeling of like, oh no, I'm going to APAC and I don't, I have nothing to say. Like, what am I working on? Nothing. I go, <laughs> oh gosh, I was feeling terrible. And I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? Um, but whatever. That's fine. I'm going to do my homework. And again, this is something I, I just never did for myself in the on-camera world that I did for, for, for this. And uh, so a couple things I did, which will relate to the story of what my friend did. Um, so beforehand, 
And I, this wasn't my own idea. I saw people talk about this. I think I saw Karen Commons post about this at one point. I made myself an Excel spreadsheet and I went to, because they send you, you know, you can look at everyone who's going to be there and what they do and who they work for, which is great. It's really cool that they do that. And again, they do that because they know that's why we're there. <laughs> so it's okay to talk about that stuff. Um, so I set up a whole spreadsheet with all the publishers that were going to be there, who they were, what their title was, their email address, their phone number. I looked at their LinkedIn, their Facebook, if I could, like if I tried to do as much as I could, I did this very quickly in the last couple of days beforehand. I, I could have spent more time on it, got their picture. So I could like either already know who they were or I took my phone out at times and was like, okay, is that who I think it is? You know, like this person. So I just got as much information as I could about the publishers, you know, so I would have something. And especially if I could find something and uh, James, yes, you can. I just saw his little uh, comment. Yeah, I um, just, I, I replied, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, and I would try, like if I found their LinkedIn or their Facebook, I would write down a little something maybe about them. Oh, they just got married or, you know, just something to have in case, just in case. Now I'll tell you, I actually ended up not actually using any of this, but it was really just good to have and know. It gave me a, a sort of a, a calmness about the whole thing. Like, as well as, um, and this is something I've found in general, when you put your energy towards something and focus, mm. it things happen. It just, that it, it's just the way it works. Um, if you focus yourself on something, you know, goal setting, that kind of a thing. I also went to APAC with a specific single goal. And I think this really helped as well. Cause I wasn't like, Oh, I got to meet everybody. I have to like make everything happen. I went, I want Tantor. I had all these friends who work with Tantor that then um, I just heard over and over like, oh, they, once you get with them, they send you book after book after book. I'm like, okay, that's what I want. I want, I want to work with somebody who's going to give me a lot of work. So I went, <laughs> Tantor, that's who I want to meet. And I actually think James was standing there when something happened. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I specifically you know, made sure to know who Brandy at Tantor was, their main casting person. And, and, and that's, that was my goal was I'm going to meet Brandy. And at the, uh, at the, um, the mixer the night before I had already talked to, so I already had a couple of people who worked with them and, uh, and had said like, Oh, you know, if, if they're around and whatever, I'll introduce you. And I'm like, great. Okay. That's how it's going to happen. And that whole <laughs> night, I like see her and my friend is there and over there. And I'm like, okay, like this isn't working out. I'm not, you know, making, this isn't, I'm not getting introduced. This is not working right. Well, randomly I was standing around. I was talking, I believe to James and, um, um, Oh, why am I suddenly spacing on his name? Audiobook speakeasy. Uh, uh, Rich Miller. Rich Miller. Rich Miller. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Rich Miller. I was talking to James and Rich and somebody else. I mean, we're standing around in a little circle chatting and it might've been James that pointed it out or was it Rich? I can't remember. Someone goes, Kurt, you're standing on something. And I look down and I'm literally sta I'm standing on a business card and I pick it up and it's Brandy's business card. <laughs> <laughs> the person, the one person I wanted to meet. This was very strange, but I took it as a sign. <laughs> like, oh, okay, of all the things to happen, I'm standing on this person's business. So I kept it. I'm like, again, okay, when I do meet her, this is something. This is a story to tell. And that's, I did use that. So anyway, I don't meet her that night. <laughs> that never works out. I'm like, okay, whatever. Go to the next day of, of APAC. Um, go through the whole day where I'm, I'm going to the, uh, yeah, total karma, uh, James. Um, I go to the, uh, I'm going to the, um, you know, to the various panels and stuff. And, uh, and that's all 
lovely and fine. And then the next to last panel was networking with publishers. I'm like, okay, well, I got to go to that one. You know, of course, got to go to that one. And of course, it's all the stuff that we all know. It's a don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't hound people. Just be yourself. <laughs> like, you know, it's all the stuff you already know. It's, yeah, what, what do you do? Just like be a human being. Okay, great. Get out of that panel. And I run into a friend of mine from LA who is in the theater community as well and became a narrator as, as well. Um, <clears throat> and I start talking to him and he tells me that was the only panel he had gone to all day because it was one, it was about networking with publishers and it was the PRH publisher, which was the one guy he hadn't met yet. I'm like, oh, the one guy he hadn't met yet. And he, so he had also done similar, I won't go get into everything he did, but he did a bunch of pre APAC work as well, which also included knowing who everyone was. He literally had flashcards for himself. He memorized everybody's name and picture and position and all that. So he knew exactly who everyone was. He did some outreach. <laughs> And what he did the whole time was instead of going to the panels, he says, that's not where the publishers are. They're all upstairs. I've been upstairs the whole time. I haven't gone to any panels. I've been talking to publishers all day, you know, introducing myself. And some of them knew who he was because of his outreach pre APAC. And, and he, and I, it, the light bulb went on. I'm like, oh, oh, right. That's why I'm here. I, I can get all this other stuff in a thousand other places. I'm here because I want to meet the publishers. And that's what he was doing all day. So instead of going to the next panel, I'm like, oh, well, I'm going upstairs with you. And I had told him my story about wanting to meet Brandy and Tantor and all that. And we walk up the stairs and we're walking down the hallway and he turns his head and he goes, there she is and goes, go. And he pushes me. And that was it. He shoved me towards Brandy and I, uh, all right. And I, that's what I did. I went, I just walked up to her and said, Brandy, uh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Kurt Bonham. Hi. And, and then I told her the story and pulled out the card. <laughs> so at least I had a nice little, like something to break the ice that was interesting and, you know, talked about the people I knew. And then it, from there, it was just chatting. And during that chat, the rest of the Tantor team came up and I got introduced to all of them and all the business cards were exchanged. And within weeks I got my first book and then started working for them. So it really was sort of about getting over the fear, you know, uh, I mean, just the fact that he, had he not turned me around and shoved me and said, go, I don't know that I would have actually done it. Because it is, it is daunting to just be like, all right, I'm just going to walk up to this person. But again, that's what he'd been doing all day. Yeah. And the fact is, is by the end of that, he, he was on the roster of three or four major publishers, had gotten a book <laughs> by the end of the day already because he put himself out there. He just, he had no fear about it. He had a game plan. And that was the thing too. I, I'm glad I did at least that, at least I'm glad I had a, a, mod a modicum of a game plan. I knew at least one person I wanted to meet. I knew the one publisher I wanted to, you know, get with. And that was it for me. I was like, if I meet a bunch of other ones, great. This is the one thing I want to do. And that really did sort of focus my energy. And it happened. That's the, you know, like it happened. And a lot of things came together to make that happen. But I think part of it was because I was focused on it and decided beforehand, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm not going to worry ab about it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. And, uh, you know, is it scary? Sure. But I think I've, I mean, in, in the, the year and a half since then, I've learned even more that there's not a lot to be scared about in this industry with the people in it and the publishers. Everybody I've met is really nice. They want people. There's a need. <laughs> they always need more narrators. You know, it's not like, oh, we have too many people. No, there's a gajillion books out there to be narrated. So there's just, there's a ton of work. They need people. They need new voices. They need unique voices. They want to know 
who you are and what you do. And if there's a place, they'll find it for you, you know, and sometimes it may happen immediately and sometimes it could take a year or two. But if, if you make those connections, um, it'll, it'll happen. You know, I, I, I think more than just about any other, especially any other part of the VO industry, audiobooks is the one where you can really just make it, you can make it happen. It's an open world where if you're willing to just put yourself out there and not worry about looking stupid or anything, just do it. Uh, things will work. Things will happen. You can absolutely make it happen. Um, so that's my APAC story. I love, I love <laughs> and story. I got to meet all of, all, of, all of you amazing people. I got to finally meet James in person and, <laughs> and you know, like so many people and it's, it's just, it's fun. You know, it's just a good time. Um, well, it's, it's, it's online too this because, year though. It's online this year. Yeah, which, which could be interesting. I, I feel like the little um, breakout groups and the APAC um, things, yeah. uh, the Zoom sessions they've had are, are really interesting because it, again, mm -hmm. it forces you. It forces you into the situation where everybody is in the same boat. So there's no reason to worry about it. You, you know, you're going to be thrust into situations with a bunch of people. So, all right, here we are. Like, let's do it. Uh, that's kind of how I feel about it. Like, just, just do it. Um, I'm, um, I'm going to stop Today, you real something quick, came sir. up that was, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop you real quick because I want to make sure, because we want to hear the imposter story. But first, I'm going to say James said he had something he, could, he was going to show us. Do you need me to give you screen share, James? No, I'm fine. Uh, okay. I just wanted to say, we were talking about, you know, when you go to um, APAC and all that kind of stuff. Well, <laughs> fortunately, after my fourth try, I was able to get into speed dating. And it was the last live one that happened in New York City before everything shut down in March. And I was going to make up my mind, you know, being an actor, they know you're an actor. They know you want to do audiobooks. They know you want to be on your roster. But I needed a nice breaker. And I didn't want to talk about books. I want to talk about something else. So I'm a, I'm a woodworker. I make these. Oh. This is a coffee mug. Ooh. And I came in there with my, my coffee mug. I could mug. use one of those. Do you ship to the UK? <laughs> oh, my God. I've made about 100 of these damn things. There are 240 different pieces of wood in this piece. Wow. And wow. I went in there and I was sipping my coffee and they said, what's that? And I said, oh, I make these. And I spent my two minutes talking about how I made this mug. Yes. Instead of, you know, yes. uh, I want to be on your roster. I want to be a narrator for your company. I want to make a million dollars doing audiobooks. I talked about this. And that humanized me yep. to them. Yep. And did you get... Did you yeah, end up I've, staying in touch with them? I got some from Tantor. I got stuff from, uh, uh, was it Diane, Dan, whatever the heck their name is. Dion. Yeah. Dion, yeah. I got my little sheet that I keep on contact with these people here. So, yeah. So, and you've been to four of them. You better watch out. No, no, James. no. I've been to one. I've tried to get in four times. I got oh, to get in four times. Once. To speed dating. One. Yeah, speed dating. It's a lottery. So, you know. Yeah. And yeah. They only, I think that there were only 15 people in that group. So I was one of fortunate 15, but that's my little icebreaker. I love that. I love that. That's perfect. Kidding, exactly. Huh? That's, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very There's some, much. James. Something that humanizes you. I also yeah, made like a, a, a trifold brochure of, you know, with the, um, um, the books that I've done with like uh, uh, thumbnails. So I just handed it them and let them look at it if they wanted to. I didn't talk about it. I just gave it to them. Do you know yeah. what I think? Because I just recently did the online speed dating and I wish that I had prepared less. And I had a practice session with Andy Arndt and it was fabulous. I loved it, but I over tried. Two minutes so goes by, by the, so fast. Yeah. And by the time I got in there, I wasn't even myself. It was the first time I ever kind of froze. So yeah, I think that that's smart. Go in there and just... You know, oh, yeah. I didn't freeze, but now I look, I look back on the online one and I feel like if I had the chance to do it over, I would want to do something like James. Yeah. I would literally rather not talk about audiobooks, and just talk about something. Just and I did, you know, I talked about circus stuff and all that, but 
I feel like I should have talked about that the whole time. Like just other random stuff that is interesting and about who you are. They know you're a narrator. Like they can look up how many books you've done. They, you know, they can get all that stuff. Um, got this marvelous voice. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, they they hear, they heard me in my booth, so they know yeah, I no. have a nice booth and I can speak. So, yeah. Next time. So Next imposter time. syndrome. Yes, um, we they re, everyone really wants to hear your take on imposter syndrome and why it doesn't exist and or why it isn't just well. Go on. Well, I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. Um, and I actually did just recently learn this though. Um, it's incorrectly named. First of all. The, the woman who actually coined the term imposter syndrome now wishes she hadn't called it that. Um, it should be called imposter phenomenon. Uh, syndrome uh, relates to like uh, an actual medical condition uh, that is something you can't get rid of or, you know, it, it has a very different connotation. Yeah. Whereas a phenomenon is something that comes and goes. Um, and that's what happens. We don't always have imposter syndrome we only have it in certain situations and going back to also this whole idea of the stories we tell ourselves i would rather we stop using the term altogether yeah and the fact that it's such a thing now we all talk about imposter syndrome imposter syndrome and i'm sorry every time you say yeah i have imposter syndrome you have imposter syndrome and every time you tell it. yourself and we have to stop, stop it. Stop. And that, oh, by the way, everyone has it. Yeah. So th that's the other thing. Uh, there was a study done in the UK. 77% of responders said, yes, I have imposter. So we all have it. So get over it. Like, not get over it, but just know you're not the only one. The person you're so worried about coming off as an imposter to feels the same way. So it's a wash. Don't worry about it. <laughs> also, I mean, seriously, we all, we all go through it. Everyone has it. But now, I mean, it's, it's similar to so many things now that we just over-diagnose everything and we over-label everything. And then people take those labels on. Uh, you know, the more we tell ourselves, yes, I'm this, I'm this, then that's the way you're going to be. That is, and and of course we get that a lot from, uh, from our our you know our parents or our uh, siblings or our friends growing up. So much of that gets programmed in when we're young. Uh, if you're told a lot the same thing over and over when you're young, kids are always looking. You know, we're the kids are little scientists. They're always testing the world and trying to find their place, and. If they're continually told something, they're going to go, oh, I guess that is true about me. And then we don't stop doing that, um, especially if we learn that young, then we're going to believe everything that shows us only that, um, as opposed to, I mean, and I, I had this problem too, uh, taking a compliment it was the hardest thing like after a show and people come up and oh they you were fantastic blah 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 and you're like no 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 <laughs> say thank you and that's what i learned to do i had to force myself to just say thank you thank you so much for coming i appreciate that instead of ah oh, no i was off tonight you know like what why why would you do that why tell why try and tell someone else that they're wrong about how good you are <laughs> <laughs> why do we do that it's it's unnecessary and i know like people people don't want to be there's a difference between being arrogant and being confident and, and, and when when they're they're giving you a gift when they're giving you a compliment and when you're saying no you're rejecting their gift that's another thing you're yeah. actually yes uh, you're doing something negative to someone else when you reject a compliment you're telling them they're wrong. You're telling somebody their their opinion is wrong. Like that's not nice. Um, but you know, we need to learn accept to accept compliments. We need to l learn to believe the good things that people say about us. Um, it's been proven over and over and over that 
we remember negative things way more deeply than we remember the positive things. There can be a hundred great things that happen. And then the first bad thing that happens, that's what we focus on. And it's usually the aberrant thing, you know? Now, of course, if you have certain things that happen repeatedly, you have to stop and look at it, you know, uh, like reviews. Reviews are a thing that you should not worry about. But sure, if you see the same thing coming up over and over and over, all right, well, then maybe I should just like take a look at that with a coach, you know, like, and see if this is an issue. But most bad reviews are like the one out of the hundred, and that's the one we all go, oh, oh, I can't believe this. Oh, I must be terrible. It's like, no, no, no. That's one person's opinion. By the way, casting directors, all those people, it's all just opinion. Now, some of them have more informed opinions, but they also have certain things that they like as well and don't like. And you may not be the cup of tea for one casting director, does not mean that the next five aren't going to love what you do. So again, as, as an actor, uh, for any of you that are actors, like a, especially if you've been long time, like actors like uh, I have or James, you know, like rejection is part of the game. You just, you cannot worry about it. You just, can't, you cannot worry about it. That, that whole idea of like, send it and forget it. You have to. And my, my wife is, She's actually a fairly successful actor. Um, sometimes I'm amazed because she cannot do that. She is the worst. And it really upsets her right now. She's waiting on a, a big role in a TV show that she auditioned for. And she just can't stop talking about it. And, we're, and I'm like, no, no. She sets herself up for disappointment. And it's, that it's, desperate it's so energy. much better to... Uh, and and yeah. as well as just that, that idea of setting yourself up. It's not, oh, uh, thick skin. I don't yeah. even think thick skin. It's not even thick skin. It's just, again, what do you have control over? You have no control over what that casting person thinks or says or does or wants or likes or doesn't. And usually you're rejected for a hundred reasons that aren't the thing you think it is. It's, oh, it's some other thing that has nothing to do with your performance. And, you know, it, we, we, it's those stories. We tell ourselves these stories about why we were rejected and we have no idea. So forget about it. You just don't know. Move on to the next thing. If you feel there's something you need to work on, work on it. Great. Don't obsess. And, in, in, and again, unless you literally have a coach you trust, so, someone who knows the business, telling you something like, okay, you need to work on this. Don't take everything that, uh, you know, well, either everything like uh, somebody randomly reviews or don't take the, the, that word as gospel. Um, I think another thing Darren Brown talks about that I really liked was he's like, you know, if you, if, you, if you go to watch a movie and it says based on a true story, you don't go, oh, well, everything I'm going to watch is the truth. You know that there's, they, they've played with it. You, you, know, you, you, you're, you, know, you know, you have skepticism. And by the way, we're all skeptical of so much, right? I mean, most of us like, well, we take a lot with a grain of salt. Why don't we do the same thing with those stories we tell the negative stories we tell about ourselves, those things that we've been, you know, programmed for years saying like, I'm not good enough or whatever. Why, why, are, why aren't we skeptical about those stories? Because that's all they are. They're just you know stories and you can tell a different story. You can tell it. You can. And you know how we started the call and I said that I think that the reason you are the way you are is because of the way you were raised, your parents and everything. So we're saying that the stories that your parents told you when you were young set you up as a core of, with a core of confidence. But if we stop and think about it, our parents, I don't know how old anyone else is, but I've been telling myself those stories. For, I've been in charge of my stories for like quite a few years now. Right. So a few yeah. times I've realized recently, wow, that story was like totally wrong. 
I, I learned it like at a time that like, I didn't know any better. I just assumed it was right. My whole, and all you have to do is you could stop telling yourself that story. Like what you said, force yourself, just stop. It's bullshit. It's not true. Stop telling yourself the story. I know it's not always that easy, but a lot of times, once you realize something's wrong, stop. Well, a good thing to do is um, start just trying to be aware of it. Mm. When you start hearing, you know, you hear that voice, stop. Listen to it from an out, as if you're an outsider. Just listen to that story and then look at it and check in with reality. Check the facts. <laughs> And most of the time you'll find the facts don't really line up with that story that's being told. Um, and uh, so it's like you have to separate the feeling from the fact. Um, and again, feelings are transitory. They don't stick around. And so much of the time we get that feeling and then that's, that's all we focus on is that negative feeling that comes from that negative story, which usually comes from some story we've been told in the past that we've internalized and decided it was our story. Usually it's someone else's story. Um, so you got to kind of step outside of it and just, you know, look at, listen to the story. Uh, another fun thing to do sometimes is like hear that story. Like uh, I'll think of an example, but take it to the extreme. So, you know, I can't think of an example, but like, oh, so-and-so thinks I'm stupid. So you like, you build on that and go, oh, they think I'm stupid. Then they're going to tell their friend and, and then this person is going to do that and build it into like the most ridiculous extreme of that story is a really good way of seeing how stupid it is. Um, Cause it, it, it just leads to nonsense. <laughs> and that's most of the time what it is. Um, and, and so much of the time, too, when we tell ourselves those stories and we listen to them in situations like networking, what we do is we then um, we shut off who we are. We, sh we shut off the reality of who we are. Um, and that, that insecurity, that worry about how we're going to come off. And the bottom line is, is who cares? <laughs> if you do come off to somebody like in a way, well, okay, then that was not the right person for you, uh, whatever. But usually that's not what happens. It's all, uh, hardly ever. Like, <sighs> again, we, we shut off those parts of ourselves that are actually interesting when we, when we do that. We, we stop ourselves from expressing what makes us who we are and try to be what we think somebody else wants us to be. Uh, and that happens through all of life. I mean, how many of us in relationships have done that where we try to be what we think this other person wants, which inevitably leads to them not wanting us because we're not actually who we are, who is the person that they wanted in the first place. So it kind of covers, covers everything in life. And is, you're inhabiting uh, you know, an energy. Just, you're giving away an energy. You're inhabiting a, either a desperate or a needy or a not authentic energy. And we sense it. We're animals. Everyone senses that oh, yeah. each other. Which is why I think that you do well. Which is why I think that people like you. Because you have, because you, you kind of like yourself, don't you? I don't not like myself. <laughs> Yeah, but a lot of people, I, that's I, quite I, unique. I recognize, I recognize my weaknesses and I'm okay with them, <laughs> I think is the thing. I, I get You like to hang out with I'm yourself. If you got stuck with yourself, you would get along with yourself. If you had to spend like a week with yourself, you would be kind of happy. Well, I, I do that a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah well, that, know, that was something else I was thinking that. about is, well, I mean, it's interesting because I'm an this idea of extrovert and introvert, I think also gets a little weird sometimes with people as well as, again, telling so many people like, I'm an introvert, I'm an introvert. And so 
they tell them that so, themselves so much that then when they get into the world, they're like, no, I'm an introvert. I don't, you know, I can't deal with people as opposed to the difference between inter, in, you know, actual like introverts and extroverts as far as like sort of personality types isn't how they relate to people at all. It has nothing to do with how much they like people or like company. It has to do with how they recharge. It's how they get energized. Extroverts get energy from interacting. Introverts get their energy. It doesn't mean they don't enjoy interacting, but they need to recharge alone. That's how they, they recharge themselves is, is by being alone. Um, I'm both. Like, I love people. I love going out and meeting people. I love that. But I also, I need my alone time. I always have. I mean, as long as I can remember, I, I have to have time to myself. And yes, I like it. I, I like time to myself. Um, I, I even like... And I think this is another thing people do is they, they, they think of their flaws as things to not like, but why? Again, it's what makes us interesting. How many times do you watch movies that if everybody's just a lovely, perfect person, how boring is that? Like the darkness and, and our flaws is what makes us human and makes, makes our lives interesting. And most people relate to it. Most of the time, your deep connections come from relating to people through those things, through the things we think are not pretty and uh, that w aren't good, but it's normal. And that's how we connect with people is a lot of times th through those things. Um, but we don't need to make those the focus. And I think that's another problem that uh, I think in America and particularly as well is, you know, we get so focused on fixing our problems yeah, and what's wrong American. with us that is american because over here yeah. people look at me like i'm crazy but it's so much part of my personality like have you ever thought what if you woke up one morning somebody said this and it was just astounding i couldn't believe it he said what if you woke up one morning and you didn't have to like fix yourself and the thought had never entered my yeah. mind i've been like self-improving since i was eight i mean it's an american thing I think it's part of what makes us so fun, but. <laughs> sure. I mean, this is something I love about, I don't know if anybody has ever worked with Paul Liberty. He's a big voiceover coach in New York and voiceover actor and actor. He was in the original Broadway production of Chorus Line, I believe. And he's just a lovely, lovely guy. And one of the things I love about him is one of his main things that he, tells everyone is you are enough you are enough you don't have to be anything you're not you are enough in who you are and what you do now that doesn't mean you can't improve in your skill set in the things you are doing like audiobook narration or whatever you know but who you you don't have to change who you are you are good you are enough you know just trust that um and, you know, it sort of just circles around to all, all the same things I've been talking about, about this, the stories we tell ourselves, which a lot of times come from other people and situations that are out of our control. And if you just stop worrying about the stuff that's out of your control, so much of that will go away. And then you can focus on the things that are on, in your control, which are your reactions, your feelings, your thoughts, and, and how you move in the world. That's all you have control over. So don't worry about the other folks. Just deal with how you react to that. And the fact is, is there's a lot of jerks. There's a lot of people who are jerks. There are people out there we see all the time that get pleasure out of hurting others and putting other people down. And if you stop, you know, frankly, have pity on those people rather than actually take it personally and be like, oh, you know, that hurts or there's something wrong with me because they're doing that. It's like, no, what's wrong with them? Nothing wrong with me. Well, why? <laughs> you know, that person has a problem, right? <laughs> Not me. 
Um, and I just think that <clears throat> spills over into pretty much everything, including networking and, and being yourself in those situations. Um, you know, just sort of own who you are. And if someone doesn't like you, 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 don't, you can't control that. Yeah. And yeah. why even try? Why bother? Why bother tr trying to fix yourself for someone else? Uh, doesn't really make sense when you stop and think about it. So See, I love this. I love the way because you, you've got an easy way about it. It's WWCD. What would Kurt do? I'm going to ask myself that now. Um, when it's not a what would Dolly do occasion, but what would Kurt do? Because you've got, because we know instinctually that this stuff is true, but we get into our own stories. And you have this lovely laser focus onto just what, what are the basics? What matters? I think people, it wouldn't hurt for them to, if you choose to have it on the playlist, listen over and over, just, change the story and relax and i told also you know, like have so much to say well and also know just like the the power you have we, we people don't realize how much how much power they have especially over them i mean not especially almost exclusively over themselves um your mind is a marvel and um, again, I come back to Darren Brown. I highly recommend people watch his specials. Um, he has one called Miracle. Um, that's a live stage show special that he did in England that he uh, disproves, well, he actually proves by disproving faith healing. And he heals people. And the entire time he's saying, I am an atheist. None of this is real. You know, like, I, it, but he literally goes through a whole thing and he, he heals people and they are healed. They are standing there saying, I have had neck problems for the past 10 years and there's, it's gone. I can move. He, you know, back issues that he, people get a, all this stuff and they believe it. And it's because they believe it. <laughs> it's yeah. not because God healed them or something. It's it's because they always had that ability to have power control over themselves. Um, and it's, again, it's about the stories and that's what he talks about. Even the, even chronic pain can become a story we tell ourselves. doesn't mean like, okay, if you have a real condition that you have to take pills for, don't stop taking your pills, but <laughs> you can, you can rearrange that story for yourself to create relief in so many areas of, of your life. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily easy and it's not easy, especially if we have been programmed from, especially if you had a, an abusive childhood or, you know, parents that told you you were bad or had a, an abusive relationship where you were gaslit and told you were crazy, you know, that can seriously affect you. But once you recognize that that's, that what other people say about you isn't the truth then you can start taking more control over over every aspect of your life you know yeah it's i mean i told joe into the eye doctor and my eyes have improved and i don't need glasses anymore and she said oh that's just something that happens when you get old i never knew that i thought your eyes would get worse and worse and worse i assumed i need strong needed stronger glasses she said no she said a lot of people when they get older, their eyes just improve. It fixes itself. You never, you have to question uh, all the stories. In that, in that Darren Brown special, he does that with two people. He takes a woman that has glasses, takes the glasses off, has her look at a program and, you know, like she can't read it and then does a healing and she reads everything perfectly. He does the opposite with somebody who has perfect vision has a program with big letters and he shows it on the camera and he's holding and he's like, everybody can read this, right? And he tells the guy, okay, I'm taking away your stuff. And the guy's like, I what did you do? Like, I it, and he like tries to read it and he can't read it. And you're looking at it on camera. So you see, there's nothing wrong with the thing. It's, it's all here. <laughs>
You yeah, can do I this totally believe to that. yourself. I totally believe that. Yeah, it's 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 kind of remarkable. Yeah. Well, Tim, uh, Tim, I just sent a message to Tim and I forgot the guest's name, Kurt. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is lovely. I'm now going to be bugging you. Ava knows this for a return appearance. And James, don't try to be discreet because you're in my headlight as well. <laughs> thank, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I really, really, I hear so many times the imposter syndrome thing. And so many people worry. There's so much anxiety and worry about who we are as we're following this path. And I see all these people are shining. And I just, I just knew there was no better person in the world mm -hmm. to point that out hey, than you. J Jody Foster thought they were going to come and take her Oscar away. So. Really? Uh, oh yeah. Well, that's the thing. Imposter syndrome is huge among people who are hugely successful. So, you know. Yeah. Yep. Nobody's going to come and give us the badge. We've got to start feeling the goods, the good feelings as now. Far as, <laughs> well, as far as audiobooks go, the, the thing to remember is, is if you got cast for a book, you got cast because you were the right voice for it and somebody wanted you to do it. So there's no imposter there. Yeah. You are the person, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kurt. You are a mensch. Fabulous. Bye. Bye.